Well, good morning. It is indeed my delight to be here with you today. Thank you for leading us in songs of praise to our Lord. I've been praying for this time that we would have together in the Word of God. And I found a prayer that was written a couple hundred years ago that I've been praying over this time. It's called, Open Our Eyes, Lord, by a Puritan named William Ames. May that good spirit of Jesus Christ open the eyes of our minds, that we may see and approve things that are excellent. May he persuade our hearts to receive the truth in the love of it and direct our steps to walk in the paths of mercy and truth that we may be saved. Amen. I've been praying that and even more together. So let's grab our Bibles and go to Galatians chapter 2 and see what we will find in the Word of God together. My wife Katie and daughter Emily and I, we live in the middle of Little Rock in this very old neighborhood and I have this old house with a large picture window. And so I'm able to look out this window and see a good part of our neighborhood. Well, I was sitting there one day and I noticed there were two young men walking up the street and they went to my neighbor's house. Well, as I looked a bit more closely, I realized that they were two young Mormon men going to my neighbor's house. Now, I know this because at about 18, 19, 20 years old, they take a two-year mission. They were also wearing short sleeve, white, button-down shirts with ties. They had materials. And if you get close enough, you'll notice they have a name tag, and it will say Elder and whatever their first name is, Bob, Dan, Mike, Jebediah, whatever it may be. So I'm sitting there looking out my window, and I'm really excited in anticipation of what's going to happen next because they're at my neighbor's house, and if you follow the order of events, they should end up at my door. And so I wait, and I wait. Neighbor doesn't answer. They go across the street. So I have a bit delayed gratification here. I'm waiting, thinking I'm next, I'm next, I'm next. And after they go to my neighbor's house across the street, they just keep walking up the hill. I thought, well, that's not fair. So I figure I've got to figure out some way to get their attention. There's got to be something I can take outside and throw into the trash. And so I grab some recycling and I go out. Well, as I step out of our kitchen into our screened in porch, we have this swinging screen door. And so as I let that door shut, I don't catch it. I just let it slam. They don't look, they just keep walking. And so as I'm walking out through our carport, we have this wood fence and my dog's back there and through the cracks and the planks, I'm talking to my dog a bit more loudly than normal. They don't look. Finally, I get to the recycling bin and I lift the lid and I throw the recycling in there way harder than what I normally would and I just let the lid slam and that did the trick. They turned and they looked at me and I waved at them. I'm throwing them a hanging curveball. All they have to do is come over and take a swing and they wave back and they just keep walking. I realized that I didn't even have the swag, I didn't have the credibility to be converted to their cult. They just didn't want to waste their time on me. They kept going. I say that a bit jokingly, but my heart was burdened for those young men. I wanted to speak to them. I was not going to let false teachers into my house, but in my yard or at the threshold of my door, I would gladly chat with them. But what if they would have walked over What if they would have walked across the street, across my yard, into my driveway? What type of Christian did they need to meet that day? What if I would have let them to the threshold of my door? What type of Christian would they need to meet? What about for you? What about for your spouse, your children, your family, your friends? What type of Christian do they need you to be? What about your neighbors? What about your employees or employers or those at your school? What type of Christian do they need to see in you? What about a world that is spiraling out of control at breakneck speeds headed towards the gates of hell? What type of Christian does a world that is hopeless and helpless, that is lost and dying, need to see? Well, rest assured, Galatians chapter 2 has some help for us this morning. We're going to see Paul is the kind of Christian that we need to be, and he demonstrates that perfectly in the life of Peter at a time when he desperately needed it. Now, I'll be honest, this morning when we look at this, some of you are going to look at Paul and go, he's a bit mean. He's a bit harsh. He's a bit direct. He's a bit too forward. But let me tell you this, rightly applying the truth of God's word is the most loving thing that we can do in any circumstance. 
I mean, consider if you went to the doctor, and as you walk into the doctor, he realizes that you have a disease, and it needs to be treated immediately. But the doctor is a really nice guy, and he doesn't want to hurt your feelings. So as he comes into the exam room with his chart open, he doesn't tell you what's on the chart. He tells you more what you want to hear, because he doesn't want to upset you. He doesn't want to rattle you. He doesn't want to disturb you. He doesn't want to make you restless. He doesn't want to scare you. He doesn't want to give you the full truth. We wouldn't go to a doctor like that. And we don't need Christians like that in our lives either. We're going to see Paul this morning skillfully applying the Word of God like a surgeon with a scalpel, cutting to the core of Peter and all those who are listening. Paul is going to show us the type of Christian that we need to be to all of those that God might put into our paths. So in Galatians chapter 2 this morning, let's stand in the honor of the reading of the Word of God as we begin at verse 11 and go through verse 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen to that one more time. Who gave me, who loved me and gave himself for me. One more time. Who loved you and gave himself for you. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if by righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. May God bless the reading, preaching, and living out of his word. You may be seated. We're going to see in verses 11 and 12, the type of Christian the world needs is number one, this. The world needs a courageous Christian, not a cowardly one. A courageous Christian, not a cowardly one. Look at verse 11. Paul writes about Cephas. Now, this is Peter, and this is Peter's name in Aramaic. In John chapter 1, verse 42, Jesus addresses Peter as Cephas. And so as we're looking here, Paul tells us that Peter came to a place called Antioch. Now, Antioch is a significant place of ministry in the New Testament. In fact, it's the place of the first Gentile church. It was the place where they were first called Christians. Now, we learn in the Bible that if you are not a Jew, then you are a Gentile. So this morning, if you're not Jewish by descent, you are a Gentile. And Jewish people saw the Gentiles as unclean and unacceptable. They didn't receive them. They would not break bread with them. Antioch did, however, have a huge population of Jewish people. Even though it was a metropolis of paganism, there were Jewish believers that were present there, and they began to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And what happened? God did his miraculous work of salvation, sovereignly working through the Spirit to convert people to him through Jesus Christ, and the Gentiles were saved. And then what happened? happens here is you have the Jewish and the Gentile believers worshiping together. You know what you have? You have the gospel breaking barriers. There is nothing that breaks barriers like the gospel. Let me just say on a sidebar, racial reconciliation has already been accomplished. It's been accomplished a couple thousand years ago on Calvary's cross where Jesus died so that all people could come together under the banner of the gospel. I don't care if you're a man, woman, you're young or old, rich or poor, the color of your skin, where you were born, how much you have, don't have, how good you are at something or how terrible you are at something. We can all gather in this place under the banner of the gospel. 
And the problem is we'll look at a problem in the world and we'll try to apply worldly tools to fix this problem when there's only a spiritual tool that has been given to us that can fix it. It is the gospel. And if we apply the gospel, God will do his work. And we see this here in Antioch as these Jewish and Gentile believers are coming together. And then we see this even more stretched out. It's here that Peter comes and he is ministering to these Gentile believers. He's teaching, he's preaching, he's having the Lord's Supper, he's discipling, he's leading. And then he's doing the one thing that most Jewish believers and people did not do with Gentiles and Gentile believers. He's breaking bread. In the early church, they had what's known as love feasts. They would gather together for a large meal, and then they would have the Lord's Supper or communion following that. And Peter is in the midst of the Gentiles doing this, which is proof that Peter received and accepted the Gentiles as those redeemed by Christ under the banner of the gospel. It's like walking into a high school cafeteria and you're carrying your tray and there's that one table that you want to be at and there's a seat open for you and you're invited to come take your seat at that table. As soon as you sit down to eat with those people, you know, I'm in. I've been accepted. I am one of them. And this is what's happened to the Gentiles. But here's what we see. This courageousness welling up in Paul because he confronts Peter. Now, this is a big deal to confront anyone, but particularly to confront an apostle. And this is not just any apostle. This is Peter, really the chief of the apostles. If you go back to the Gospels and you read the list, Peter's name is always listed first. He's always the one taking charge, stepping out of the boat, saying, Jesus, we'll die for you. Jesus, do you want us to build some altars for you here? All of those things, Peter taking charge in the Gospels with his name listed first. But if you go through the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 12, Peter is the primary figure leading the church that the Lord is working through. And so this is significant because it's a reminder to us, there is no one that is outside the bounds and the authority of the Word of God. No matter where you find yourself placed at in society, we all sit under judgment of the Word of God. So how was it that Paul made this courageous confrontation of Peter, the chief of the apostles? He didn't do it as a keyboard warrior living in his mom's basement on social media. He didn't blog about it. Scripture's clear. He didn't talk about Peter. He talked to Peter. Verse 11 tells us that he opposed Cephas, Peter, to his face. Now, what was it that Peter did that was so bad that Paul had to courageously confront him? Well, if we look at verse 12, we see Paul mention here the answer in that it begins with some men who came from James. Now, this is not James, the brother of John, the apostle. This is not James, the apostle. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Well, how in the world could Jesus have half-brother? brothers and sisters. Well, he came from the father. He was born of a virgin, Mary, and then Joseph and Mary had other children following the birth of Jesus, half-brothers and half-sisters. And James is one of those half-brothers. Now, here's the truth. They probably came from the place that James was at, but there was in no way, shape, or form that James would have actually sent these men to Antioch to stir up discord and trouble. James might have had his struggles with the Jews and Gentiles coming together around the table, but in no way, shape, or form did James endorse the doctrine that these men held. And these men are known as the Judaizers. And if you've been with us in the book of Galatians, we've learned about them along the way. They believed, oh, I have to have faith, but not just faith. I also have to keep certain parts of the Old Testament law, and particularly the dietary laws and the circumcision laws. In verse 12, he calls them the circumcision party. You know who these Judaizers are? They are self-righteous hypocrites, heretics, peddling false doctrine. They are not to be welcomed into homes. They are to be kept out. They are to be rooted out and removed from the church. And they would have shown up to Antioch teaching the people, you don't break bread with these unclean, unworthy, unacceptable Gentiles. And it takes a courageous Christian to confront this type of error. And this is what we see here. It's here that Paul shows us a courageous Christian. And then on the other hand, it is Peter who shows us a cowardly Christian. Because when the Judaizers show up to Antioch, what does Peter do? He pulls away. Now verse 12 tells us that Peter was eating with the Gentiles. This is not a one and done meal. And the reason is in the Greek, it's written in the imperfect tense, which means it was a continuing action that he was eating with them regularly while he was in Antioch until the Judaizers show up. And verse 12 tells us, what did Peter do? He drew 
back. He pulled back. And the word here in the original hints at a strategic military retreat. He was sneaky about it. He intended to hide so that the Judaizers would not see him with the Gentiles. In today's terms, he would have stopped texting them back. He would have not taken their calls. It would have went straight to voicemail and deleted. He would have blocked them, and he would have avoided every single place that they would have gone because he did not want to cross paths with them and risk the chance of being seen with them. Peter knew these Judaizers were in error. He knew their theology was abhorrent, but he nonetheless did this anyway. And it gets even worse because if we look back at Peter, he knows so much more than the average person. In Acts chapter 15, they have this council that comes together called the Jerusalem Council, and they are in finality settling what a person must do to be safe. Peter was there. He knew the answer to that question. It was by faith and grace in Christ alone, not by our works. In Acts chapter 10, God called Peter specifically in a vision, and he showed him that the gospel is for all people, that the Gentiles are acceptable. You can eat whatever you want. So Peter could go to the grocery store and eat bacon, and it not be a sin. He could feel just fine about that. And so we see Peter with these experiences, seeing the gospel is for all people. But why would Peter do this after all that he knew and all that he'd experienced? Verse 12 tells us, Peter feared them. He feared the Judaizers. And what was it that he was afraid of? They weren't going to persecute him or string him up and, and, and beat him. No, the worst thing that would have happened to him is he would have lost popularity and credibility and likability with the Judaizers. They wouldn't have liked him. That's not much different for us today, is it? And what's the worst thing that's going to happen to us right now? I mean, I will tell you, I believe persecution is coming because if we continue to put godless leaders in office, they're going to continue to oppose all things that have to do with the gospel that are right and pure. But right now, you're going to get canceled. That's the worst thing that's going to happen to you. You will be canceled. And so how often do we act cowardly because we're afraid, oh, the world's not going to like us. They're not going to think we're nice. Do you think Paul cared about that? He was courageous in the face of the Judaizers and Peter. If you want to see courageous Christians, oh my goodness, just look at the span of church history. For example, John Huss is a courageous Christian who stood for truth. Listen to an excerpt of his story. John Huss refused to renounce his alleged errors unless he could be shown otherwise from Scripture. To the council, he said, I would not, for a chapel full of gold, recede from the truth. Formally condemned, he was handed over to the secular authorities to be burned at the stake on July 6 of 1415. Arriving at the place of execution, he was asked by the empire's marshal if he would finally retract his views. Huss replied, God is my witness that the evidence against me is false. I have never thought nor preached except with the one intention of winning men, if possible, from their sins. Today, I will gladly die. The fire was lit. As the flames engulfed him, Huss began to sing in Latin a Christian chant, Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. We need that kind of courage today that kind of courage. We are to fear God, not man. And there are many of us, and I've been there as well, professing believers like Peter in this situation. We are absolutely petrified and paralyzed with fear about the, what the world will think. We need more people like Paul who will courageously stand for the truth. And let me just warn you, the moment you do, the moment you speak up, you're going to feel alone in the room. You're going to feel very lonely, but I would ask you to take heed and stock in the words of John Knox. A man with God is always in the majority. We need courageous Christians, not cowardly ones, and Paul shows us this here. But if we continue through the text, let's move to verses 13 and 14, and it brings us to the next type of Christian the world needs. Number two, a consistent Christian, not a compromising Christian. 
a consistent Christian, not a compromising Christian. Verse 13 tells us about Peter's compromising, and it is found in his hypocrisy. Now, in the Greek, the word hypocrisy is likened to wearing a mask for theater. You put a mask on, just like at Halloween, and you pretend to be something that you're not, to trick or to fool people. And Peter here had modeled Christian love and hospitality to the Gentiles just like he was supposed to, but he became hypocritical when he compromised and pulled away from the Gentiles when the Judaizers showed up. Now, Peter's compromise, his hypocrisy had far-reaching results. In fact, if you sin, I sin, Peter sin, it's like throwing a stone in the water. It has ripple effects that go out. And let me tell you, the bigger the sin, the bigger the stone, the far-reaching effects that it has, the farther and more powerful the ripples go. And we see here that his sin in verse 13 led away, led astray the Jews and even Barnabas followed Peter in his compromise. Now, verse 14 is going to show us the heart of this hypocrisy, the heart of the compromise. He says here, they were not in step with the truth of the gospel. In other words, Peter was not walking straight. He was not following the straight line of the Word of God. You think of the word orthopedic. It's where we get this phrase in today's terms. You go to an orthopedist and they help your body to get better, to walk straight. You don't walk with a limp. You stand straight up. Same here. And Peter, he was crippled. He was stunned. He was not walking straight, and he led the others to do so with him. Hypocrisy is fake. It's false. It's a facade. It's a fraud. It looks like one thing when it's totally different. When my daughter, Emily, was very small, there was a period where she had to be on formula. And we were at the store one day, and I looked on the shelf, and Katie said, I need that formula there. So I reached up there to get it, and I said, well, hold on a second. This formula is $14. This one is $8, and they seem exactly the same. She said, Brad, she can't have the $8 formula. Her stomach can't handle it. We need the $14 formula. I didn't buy it. I didn't believe it. I bought the formula, but I didn't buy what she was selling me there on the aisle of Walmart. So later, as the weeks go by, she said, hey, we need some more formula when you're out and about. Can you grab some? I said, sure, I will. So I went by there, and I looked on the shelf. There's the $14 one. There's the $8 one. By myself, I grabbed the $8 formula. I get home before she does. I take the almost empty can of $14 formula, and I dump the $8 formula in there, put the lid on it, put it on a shelf, think I'm home free. After a couple weeks, I'll prove my point. Well, that evening, we all got home, and Katie made Emily a bottle, and she got about a quarter of the way through it and just started throwing up everywhere. <laughs> and let me just tell you, it didn't go well for me the rest of the evening in the house. I had to fess up. But my goal was compromise, hypocrisy, to make one thing look like another. And we do that in small things, but when we do it in a big way, like Peter, we realize that compromise and hypocrisy, they're first cousins. They always go together. They look a whole lot alike. The rest of verse 14 can be a bit confusing at first glance, but hang with me. He says here, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So what Paul is saying here, he's saying, Peter, you lived with the Gentiles. You've been with him here in Antioch. You were one of them. You were not like those Judaizers and those other Jews who separated themselves from the Gentiles by the hard demands of the law. You were just fine being with them. But now, when these other guys show up, you're looking at the Gentiles saying, you need to live like us. You need to come over here. He's saying it's hypocritical. You are compromising. And here's the big problem where this connects with us today, where we live. It's like us saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to go over here and live like the world. I'm going to go mix it up like the world. So you really can't tell the difference between this so-called Christian and the world. And then you look at the world and you say, you need to live like that. And then they look at you and they go, you're not living like that. You're living like us, but yet you're calling us to live like that. It's inconsistency and the world can see right through it. The world is in desperate need of consistent Christians and before we judge Peter, which is easy to do here, we got to check our own hearts. We can become guilty of committing the very sins that we speak and preach against. I mean, people are watching us, and we have a tremendous amount of influence, way more than what you realize. And if you don't think you have any influence at all, just look at the ones that are in your home. They are watching you as well. And one of the best ways to defend the truth is to live the truth. And we don't reach the world by compromising and becoming like the world. 
because eventually we're going to have to draw that line in the sand and come down hard on one side or the other. We don't reach the world by compromising and becoming like the world. We reach the world because we are so distinctly different because we have something that they don't and they cannot get anywhere else. And when we live it and speak it, it is something that God works through to draw people to himself. Our belief and our behavior must match. Our duty and our doctrine must match. Our confession and our character must intersect. Verses 15 through 21, Paul moves on and he gives one of the most clearest, crystal clearest passages on salvation in all of the New Testament. And we see thirdly, the world needs this, a confessing Christian, not a confusing one. To get some Christians to confess to any type of firm belief in anything is literally like walking up to the wall with some jello and a hammer and a nail and try to make it stick. It's like nailing jello to the wall. It slips, it slides, and it breaks apart. If you've been down the YouTube vortex where you start watching one video and then another one comes up and you watch that one and you watch that one before long, a couple hours have gone by and you've watched all these YouTube videos. It happened to me one evening and I happened to come across a video of Larry King and Joel Osteen. Now, some of you, you don't know me at all. Uh, but you probably could already pick up how I feel about Joel Osteen and his false teaching. Some of you, you know me real well, and you're like, you didn't have to say that. I already knew it. But I was watching this interview, and Larry King has interviewed some solid guys in the faith over the years, so he knows the Christian perspective and the Christian answer. He himself is not a believer, but as he's asking Joel, what does it take for a person to go to heaven, essentially is what he's asking him. And Joel says, well, I believe faith in Jesus Christ. Well, Larry is smart enough, and he's been exposed to enough truth that he says, oh, what about those who don't believe in Jesus Christ? Are they okay? And he kept pushing him, and this is about a two, three-minute clip. And in this two or three-minute clip, I counted eight times to Larry's questions. Joel said, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what we need? Men and women who know. And we must know the confession because what it is, it is straight confusion if we're not going to come down firm on the beliefs that are clearly given to us in the Word of God. In the next seven verses, Paul gives us something to know. It is the confession, and there's so much in these next seven verses. We're only going to have time to hit the high points, but in verses 15 and 16, Paul is defining this confession, and then in 17 through 21, he defends this confession. So what's the confession? It's what Joel missed in his video in his interview with Larry King. It is justification by faith alone in Christ alone, period, the end. Martin Luther said, if the doctrine of justification is lost, all Christian doctrine is lost. In other words, if all of our Christian doctrines, all of our confessions were like oranges on a produce section in the grocery store, and you were to walk up and you were to pull out a bottom orange, what's going to happen to the rest? They're all going to collapse and fall there. The doctrine of justification by faith alone and Christ alone is a bottom orange. If you pull that, everything else is going to fall. We have nothing to stand on. Now, verse 15 can seem very confusing here. Look at that with me. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And not to get too technical here, but we do have to address this so we can get some clarity to the rest of this text. Paul is not saying that the Jews were not sinners. They are sinners just like everybody else. We are all sinners in need of the saving grace of God. But what he's going to make the point here is this, is that the Jews had the law and the Gentiles didn't. The Jews knew the law, the Gentiles didn't. The Jews abided by the law, mostly, but the Gentiles didn't. And he's saying, you guys now know the law can't save you. How in the world do you think it's going to save the Gentiles if it won't even save you? Now, when I say the law, and I've referenced that earlier in the message, when I say the law, I'm talking about generally the first five books of the Old Testament. Those are called the Torah, which in Hebrew we think of law, but more specifically in those books that Moses wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's Exodus and Leviticus. You know in your Bible reading plans when things are going well, you know it starts to slow down when you hit the law. And the law, it has hundreds and hundreds of commands, 600 plus commands that the people of Israel are to follow. Here's a good way to think of it the next time you read the law. It's a threefold nature to it. 
One, there's some civil laws. They lived under what's known as a theocracy. It was God ruling through Moses and then later Joshua. is not a socialist state or a communist state or a democracy or a republic. It wasn't even a monarch at the time. Later they do get a king. So you have to understand it's a theocracy. So there are civil laws about giving and supporting that you just do as a member of the society. Some of the law hits under that. There's also some ceremonial laws that have to do with festivals and feasts and sacrifices and all of those Christ is fulfilled. So today we don't live under that civil ceremonial law. Christ has fulfilled those. They are completed. But the part of the law that we live under is the moral law. And the moral law would include a lot of things, but particularly the Ten Commandments. And we can compare ourselves to all the law, but particularly the moral law. Here's what we see. We've broken it. The law, as Scripture says, it's our schoolmaster. It teaches us about our sin. As Scripture teaches us, the law is a mirror. It shows and reflects our sin. And no one will come to Christ until they realize they have broken the law. And you think, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as this guy or that girl. Think about a huge mirror. And if you have a hammer and you walk up and you hit that mirror at any point, it's going to break there and it's going to fracture the rest of it. It's James chapter 2, verse 10. Hey, if you've offended any point of the law, you've offended it all. You've broken the whole thing. And even though we might sin a little differently than each other, we've still all hit the mirror of the law at some point, and it has fractured all the way across. But Paul here gives us the answer to the broken law. And it's this in verse 16. It's the word justified. Listen to me read verse 16 again and just highlight three times him using this phrase. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. See, justification is this. It's the act whereby God makes the believing sinner righteous in Jesus Christ. It happens one time. We call it conversion, regeneration. You are made alive in Christ. You are justified. You are innocent before God. It's not just like a pardon. If you get pardoned, you still have a a record. People still remember it. When you are justified before God, all of your sins, past, present, future, wiped clean, forgiven, One way to remember what the word justification means is this. Justification, just as if I, justification, just as if I have never sinned. If you are in Christ, that is your status before God. He will see you one day before his throne as if you have never sinned. Because upon the cross, Christ brought your debt to zero of sin that you owe God. But it's more than that. He added into your account the righteousness of God. And this justification, it's not accomplished by our works. You can't earn it. It's accomplished only by faith in Jesus Christ. And the big deal here is Peter believed that, but by his actions, it was confusing because everybody that saw it just assumed, oh, Peter must believe what the Judaizers believed because he's going with them. It was as if he was endorsing their doctrine. It was confusion, not confession. Now, that's what justification is, as we see in verses 15 and 16. But the rest of the passage, Paul makes this defense for it. And he is like a skilled attorney in the courtroom giving a master class defense on justification. And he's going through, and this can kind of get bogged down a bit too. But understand, Paul is using some hypotheticals to help make his point here. He says first, well, let's just say the Judaizers are right. Obviously, we know the Judaizers are not right. But let's just say they were right. That would mean by default, and I even hate to say this even as an example, and I'm sure Paul felt this tension too, if the Judaizers are right, then that would mean Christ would have to be wrong. And if that's the case, it would be the law is what's pushing you to salvation, not to your sin. And then the opposite of that means that Christ is actually pushing you to sin if you're not obeying the law. And we know it's just the opposite. The law shows us our sin, but Christ shows us salvation. And Paul says here emphatically, certainly not. That is not the case. And then he says, if you believe this, you're basically calling Christ a fraud. You're calling him a liar because he said who he was and what he could do about your sin. And if you're still trying to hold the works of the law to take care of your sin and to make your own way for salvation, you're looking at Christ going, you lied. You did not do what you said you were going to do. But he continues. He talks to Peter in the crowd, and he says, you weren't saved. I wasn't saved. No one is saved by the law. But yet, 
you're running back to the law. Peter, you ran back to the law when you chummed up to the Judaizers. You tore down the law when you preached salvation by grace. But when you run over here, it's like you're building it back up by your works. And when you try to earn your own salvation, when you try to build up your salvation by your own goodness and righteousness and works, not only are we calling Christ a fraud saying he couldn't do what he said he was going to do, we're calling him insufficient. That even if he could, it wasn't quite enough. That's where we have to come in and make up the slack. Christ is not a fraud. And Christ is not insufficient. His work was truth and his work is sufficient to do all that we need to do. Besides, if we could save ourselves, why in the world would Christ have to come to die? That is our confession. We can't, so he did. Paul emphatically makes this point in verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. He's saying if you could do it yourself, Christ died for nothing but we know we can't. So Christ died for something, to redeem a people to himself. If you add anything to the gospel, anything at all, it ceases to be the gospel. See, the law says do, but Christ has said done. And we realize these works don't save us, but the good news is this, the works are proof that we have been saved. And then we get to this point, we don't obey because we have to, though we certainly need to and we're commanded to, we obey because we want to out of the love for the one who has been so kind to pay the penalty and debt for our sin upon the cross and give to us his righteousness. In verses 19 and 20, the heart of this passage, we see how we are empowered to be a courageous, a consistent and confessing Christian. The word live is written five times in these verses. We are to live in this way. Listen to it. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is written in the Greek present tense, which means this, something that happened in the past that is still giving us continuous results. What happened in the past? Christ died for sin so that you might live. And the result that's continuing today is you can live in him because you have died to yourself. It says the reformers said in the Reformation, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus. What that means is in grace alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone. Those are the three legs of the stool of salvation that you can sit your bottom on and rest and it will hold you up. If you remove any of the legs of that stool and you try to rest on your own works, you will fall. And that's the point Paul is making. The confession is this, justification by faith. It is grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. Now, we don't have a response here written in the text from Peter. You can't help but wonder what in the world was Peter thinking as he just got blasted. I mean, Paul did this publicly in front of everyone, not just to his face, but in front of everyone because a public sin required a public address. And Paul kept with his words to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.20 where he addresses the sin of an elder publicly. That's what he had to do for Peter here. But we realize that Peter responded and he responded well. As we read 1 Peter, the whole theme of 1 Peter is the true grace of God. And the word grace is on every chapter of that book, every page of that book. That's Peter and Paul, but let me ask you, what about you and me? Job chapter 9 verse 2 says this, How can a man be in the right before God? This is the most important question that anyone can ever ask or answer. And if you're not asking yourself that question, I'll tell you this, you will have to answer it one day, as will I. We will all have to answer, how can we be right before God? We're all going to stand before the Lord as our judge. And on that day, the sentence is going to be right or wrong. It's going to be innocent or guilty. It's going to be justification or condemnation. There is no third way or middle road. I love what Adrian Rogers says. I wouldn't trust the best 15 minutes of my life to get me to heaven. And I hope that you're not either. What are you trusting today? What the world needs most is the gospel. And the gospel is brought most effectively when courageous, consistent, confessing Christians are bearing it like Paul did in Antioch to Peter and all those who heard. We take a moment right where you're at and just bow with me. 
as you're bowing, considering all that we talked about this morning from the Lord's Word, I pray the Spirit of God has brought something to your mind or heart. I'm going to just ask you some questions. And as I ask you these questions, I'm going to ask you where you sit with the Lord to ask Him those questions about yourself. You're running diagnostics on your soul right now. And there's no one, no thing that can do that better than the Word of God. Ask yourself, how courageous have I been in my faith? Am I boldly standing upon the truth? Or is it just under pressure? You unravel like a cheap sweater. You become cowardly instead of courageous. What might you need to do to become a more courageous Christian for the glory of the Lord? Do you ask yourself, how consistent have I been in my faith? Does my walk match my talk? If someone were to find out I was a Christian, would they be absolutely shocked to know that about me? Ask the Lord how you might live a life where your walk and talk, your belief and your behavior, your duty, your doctrine, your confession, your character are aligned under the Word of God. Let me ask you this, what's your confession? Are you relying upon any work at all within yourself for salvation? If so, you've broken a leg on that stool, whether it's grace, faith, Christ. It's in those alone that we are saved. Have you come to faith in Jesus Christ? In a moment, we're going to sing, and as we do, there'll be some staff members available for you to visit with. If you're tired of trying to earn your own salvation and you want to surrender to Christ, here's what I ask you to do. Go to one of them and say, I'm tired of fighting the Lord. I cannot earn this. I want the grace and faith that is found only in Christ alone. Would you just go? They will show you in his word how you can have freedom from your sin. Others of you, you might need just prayers for consistency. You might need prayers for courage. You might need prayers to have courage and consistency in your confession. You're saved. You've been justified by faith, but you need the strength. In a moment, you can come pray here at the front alone and do business with the Lord. Or if you need someone to pray with you, you find a staff member and just ask them to pray over you in one of those areas. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, this is your time. This is your day. This is your church. These are your people. This is your word. And this is your spirit who moves and works. And Father, as we faithfully have opened the text today, I pray that we would be much like Paul and give the world exactly what it needs and the truth. And the truth is going to be found in a courageous, consistent, confessing Christian. And I pray that you would give us boldness. We don't have to be brash. We don't have to be mean and hateful. We don't have to be harsh but we must stand firmly on the word of God and not budge, not take a step back. God, I pray that we would be consistent so that what we are standing on, if people disagree with this, they can at least look and go, at least you're living what you say. And then, Father, I pray we're saying the right thing, that that confession is this, justification by faith. It is in grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. There is no other way. God, help us to be a people that no. Let us not be a people that do not know. Let us be a people that know and boldly live it and declare it. And so, Father, I pray you would move in hearts that there is one here who is trying to trust their own works for salvation. God, would you move in their life today in such a way that you would draw them to stop running on their own merit and just simply fall and rest in you. Give them freedom from their sin freedom from their fight, just freedom to pause and trust you in the work you've done for them upon the cross and your righteous life given to them. Father, for others, they just need to stand. They need consistency. God, I pray that you would work and move in them to help them give the world exactly what it needs today through the gospel. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.